tonight's workshop is terrific, and I want to especially thank uh, the speakers for inviting me to give a talk on my birthday. I'm sure that was not planned, but nonetheless, uh, it's a oops, it's a nice way to get started. Happy okay. Birthday, uh, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So th this is the view outside my office here toward the Pacific uh, here in La Jolla. Uh, and you've already seen this, this diagram. Uh, and in th this, uh, I just want to emphasize here that what we're trying to do is bridge these levels. This is the key. Uh, you can't do it all the way, you know, as, as people in psychiatry have tried to do it uh, f from molecules directly leaping to the entire central nervous system. Uh, we're going to have to do it in steps. And uh, in this particular talk, I'm going to be focusing here uh, at the level of, of what might be happening in the cubic millimeter of cortex, which we, other speakers uh, this morning will be focusing on as well. Uh, the connections between the neurons, uh, the small networks that occur, or not so small, but uh, the idea though is to try to understand computationally uh, how those networks are organized. So I'm going to be focusing on working memory. And uh, if you go back uh, over the literature in computational neuroscience, you'll see that there are a number of models. And probably the model that has had the most traction has been the attractor model. Uh, and this really uh, goes back to uh, the, the Hopfield era in the 80s when uh, he noticed that, that with strong nonlinearities, you can get <clears throat> uh, stable states uh, in, a, in a fully recurrent network with excitatory connections uh, in this particular case uh, for pyramidal cells uh, and then for some inhibition stabilizing the network. Uh, you, you can show that, uh, that you get hysteresis. That is to say, if you have an input uh, and then keep increasing the strength of the input, you'll reach a point where it jumps to another limb of this uh, phase diagram. And then as you decrease the input, it'll stay at a high rate so that at uh, going back to the same input, you can have a stable uh, active state. And, of, and this is actually what is seen, if you record from neurons, uh, Pat Golden Rakesh in the prefrontal cortex, but also uh, Richard Anderson in the, in the posterior parietal cortex showed that if you have a monkey that's been trained to do a delay uh, task, for example, to remember where there was a spot on the screen and then to, to uh, move your hand or your eye to the spot, uh, that there are neurons that are active during that delay period that are selected for that spot. Uh, so, th so this is a, a very nice uh, example. Uh, it illustrates that for a long time, the way that we made progress is by having an idea, uh, these, these attractor states, for example, uh, and then trying to use it to interpret data. And, and we have made progress. But I'm going to be showing you today that there may be another way that uh, could t bring us to uh, other motifs that might actually uh, be tested and um, you know, that might, you might not have thought of uh, immediately. So I'm going to start with, uh, and, and also uh, the, in this talk, I'm going to be uh, starting with uh, rate-coded networks. Uh, and, and there's a uh, nice review paper here by Larry Abbott uh, showing that you can train these networks to uh, produce uh, you know, dynamic outputs. And of course, the problem is that um, it's difficult to go from a rate network to a spiking network. Um, and you know, the, the, the problem is that uh, that if, if, if you replace, for example, each of the rate neurons with, say, 100 spiking neurons, you could get something that approximates it. But uh, because of the variance in the noise, it uh, often doesn't perform very well. So and that's not very efficient. Uh, so uh, Robert Kim, who uh, is, was a graduate student in my lab, just finished up, uh, has a paper that was published in PNAS in 2019, which surprisingly found a very simple solution to this problem. So we can now transfer a recurrent network that's been trained, say, with backprop uh, to a spiking network one for one, one spiking neuron, one uh, leaky integrating fire neuron for every rate neuron. And the key turned out to be scaling the weights with this lambda parameter. So first you train up the recurrent neural network. Uh, in this case, it's just a simple integration of the input 
and, and here's the output. You can see it, it, it's been trained up and it works very well. But now if you, if you transfer the weights one for one, uh, at lambda equals one, you can see that it destroys the performance. Uh, this, this is, uh, <laughs> even the baseline here you see is going up. It's, it's, not, it's, it's overactive. But if you reduce the strength by a factor of 50 to 0.02, you restored the performance. So we, here we have a spiking network that's performing just as well as the rate encoded network. And that's what we're gonna use here for exploring working memory. Uh, so here's an example of a working memory task. It's, a, it's an exclusive OR, but with a time delay. So if, if, there, if the inputs are uh, the first and second stimulus separated by half a second are both in the same direction, you wanna go up both down, you want to go up, and if it's uh, uh, not in the same direction, then you want to go down. And, uh, and, and you can train up the uh, recurrent neural network to do it. You can transfer it, and this is actually uh, the response now from the spiking network. You can see after the first stimulus, it'll go off in one direction or the next. This is a principal component uh, diagram for the two, PC one, two, and three. And then uh, for the second uh, input, uh, it will make a second decision. So. So this is just an example of, 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 of you know, a, a way that you can uh, use it to study delay period activity. But now we want to find out exactly how does the network actually do it. And we're going to be comparing it to uh, data recorded from the prefrontal cortex uh, by Constant and Edis. Uh, it was data set that's available publicly through CRCNS. Um, and here's the task that they trained a monkey to do. And it's a very large data set, so it's very rich. Uh, first, you fixate, a cue comes on uh, either on the left side or the right side, and then there's a delay of a period of a second and a half, and then a, the sample comes up, and if it's the same, uh, you, 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 you move your eye up, and if it's uh, opposite direction, you move your eye down. And so here's the two different conditions, and you can see the, this is the 150 neurons that are available, and you can, we now have them available for analysis. So the first step was to train up our recurrent neural network on the very same task. And, and you can see that we've done it here. You can see the um, activity pattern here. Uh, we had a restriction. We restricted the network 80% ex pure excitatory, 20% pure inhibitory so that we could match it to ex recordings. And we wanted a metric that we could use for uh, assaying the similarity or difference with the recorded data. And so we use the autocorrelation, which was a measure that they introduced. So the idea is you bin it in 50 millisecond bins, and you just, for, for each neuron, you count the number of spikes per bin. And that's shown here, zero, one, or two. And then you autocorrelation of the bin data, and here's what it looks like. Uh, it falls off with some time constant, in this case, 177 milliseconds. And we use that as an assay. So, so first of all, uh, let's look at the uh, experimental data, uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, and, and here's the, uh, uh, for each of the neurons, uh, what was the uh, time constant? Uh, and you can see the distribution here. It, uh, the median is 100 milliseconds, and there are some longer and some shorter. So we, we, we broke it into two groups, the shorter and the longer. Um, and now we're comparing it to the trained neural network. You can see the distribution looks very similar, very different from the untrained recurrent network, which has primarily the, the lower, uh, the, the smaller time constants. But you can see that for the two groups, the, the recurrent neural network has uh, time constants that match the recorded data and also the firing rates match the recorded data. So we think we we're off to a good start here in terms of matching the data and trying to understand uh, you know, how to interpret uh, the, the uh, recordings. Now, the difference with, with recordings is that, of course, we have access to the network. We can go into the network. We can actually try to assay, assay. We can manipulate it. We can try to get to the bottom of what mechanism it's using. Uh, first, uh, there's another measure we use, which is discriminability. The question is, if you, you just had access to the uh, activity pattern during, say, the delay task, and try to predict what was the first stimulus, how well could you do? So this is how well you can do with the prefrontal cortex data. And, and you can see here the uh, yellow is basically good discriminability. And you can see here that uh, for the recurrent neural network, it, it, it's a very similar pattern, much uh, higher discriminability for the longer 
time constants. Interestingly, the uh, shorter time constants are very important for uh, encoding the queue. So that's why they're there. And then the longer time constants for the delay period. So uh, let, let's compare the uh, delay period task to a task that doesn't require any uh, working memory. And this is an example of alternative uh, first force choice, another common task that's given to monkeys. And the idea is that without any delay, you just have to respond to a queue. Either the queue is up, in which case you press one button, or the queue is down and you press another button. Um, and so training up the recurrent network and transferring it to the spiking network, you can see here that the median is much lower. It's 43 milliseconds rather than up here above 150. So this suggests that it's, those neurons with long time constants are really the ones that are responsible. Um, now a clue to what's going on in the network comes when we looked at specifically at the inhibitory strengths. With the alternative force choice, uh, the strength between the inhibitory neurons, the connections between inhibitory neurons was much weaker than for the ones that were there after training on delayed match the sample. And in, indeed, uh, if we, if we uh, shuffle the connections between the inhibitory neurons, we can see that the time scale goes way down uh, as, as opposed to the other t the connections within the network. We scramble those, <clears throat> we still have the longer time scales. So <clears throat> that suggests we should focus on the inhibitory cells. And indeed, that was the key. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so first of all, let's look at the inputs. So the, it, it turns out that there are two subpopulations of inhibitory neurons. There's, there's uh, one subpopulation that gets strong uh, excitatory input from the positive cues. Um, and there's another subset that get inputs from the negative cues. And also uh, the, the subpopulation that has Positive cues have a lot of connections between them, inhibitory connections, and similarly for the other subpopulation. Uh, if, if, we, uh, if, if we change the strength of the inhibition between, uh, the subpop within the subpop with, between the two subpopulations, between sub the, the positive and the negatives, uh, the time scale changes drastically, as you can see here. It goes way down if you reduce it by 30%. It actually goes up if you increase it by 30%. And the accuracy goes up too. Uh, but if you change the strengths of the connections within uh, the, the, the inhibitory strengths, uh, uh, you, you, can, you can see that that has uh, much less of an, of, of an impact. So, so this suggests a model. This is a disinhibition model for working memory. Uh, so here's how it works. We have these two subpopulations that inhibit each other. And this is basically a flip-flop. And when one of the populations is active, the other one isn't, which means that it's turned off, which means that uh, it disinhibits the excitatory population that it's connected to, which then produces activity. Uh, the other uh, subpopulation of excitatory cells is turned off. And during the delay period, that is maintained because this is a stable flip-flop. Uh, and, and this may account for the long time constants. So this is, this is an, uh, I think a good starting point because this is a new mo a motif uh, that we can explore. Uh, so here's, here's another task, uh, which is context signaling. The idea is we have two inputs and the goal is to integrate either input from uh, modality one or two, depending on the context. And uh, this, this uh, is the kind of task that was done, for example, by Mill Newsom when he had these random dots that were, uh, where, where the correlation of movement to the right or left was decreased to the, to the point where the monkey couldn't distinguish anymore psychophysically. But then he had a second task, which was the color. He varied the fraction of dots that were red or green. And so uh, the monkey did both tasks. It was queued ahead of time. And so this network is capable of doing that too. Now the, 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 the question that we're exploring here is transfer from one network to another. And uh, we, we're going to start with two different networks, the alternative force choice or the delayed match of sample. And remember, the alternative force choice has low uh, autocorrelation time constants and DMS has high. And so we can see that when we <clears throat> uh, 
are transferring from either of these, we can transfer to this new task, the context task, task with very high accuracy. But now let's try transferring from the AFC to the DMS. Uh, and actually we want a two task. We, so there's two tasks that are equivalent, de delayed match sample or delayed non match sample, right? But so let's transfer uh, fr from AFC to uh, delayed non match. And uh, it, it, it fails completely. So with the normal connection strengths uh, after training, it's at 50%, which is basically chance. Now you can increase the performance a little bit if you increase the strengths of the inhibitory connections, again, suggesting that those are the strengths that are important for the delayed match. Uh, but it's uh, far from uh, 100%. Interestingly, if, if you take the delayed match and then retrain it on delayed non-match, it learns very rapidly and gets up to 100%. And so what this suggests is that it's really important to start with a network that has these long time constants in them before you start the task, training on the new task. Uh, well, it turned out that the data set uh, had, uh, d before the, tr the monkeys were trained, it, it c collected recordings from neurons and prefrontal cortex on a passive task. And, and here, uh, the monkey was just trained to fixate, but it, it was given the same sequence of inputs, but it was trained not to do anything. So it just basically was collecting data on what the resting uh, recordings, you know, what was the, what was the time constant, time scale during uh, a, a monkey that didn't know anything about the task. And, and here's the results. The result is that it had long time constants. And so with this suggests is that, and we know that, that the time constants in the, uh, prefrontal cortex uh, are long. And, and the idea is that maybe these are pre-wired to be long uh, in terms of the connections be between the inhibitory subpopulations. And we also know that if you look at the same recordings, I'm not showing you here, but in the earlier sensory areas, metasensory and auditory and visual areas, the time constants are, are low. They're in the, you know, the 10, 20, 30 millisecond range. So there's a gradient of time constants from the back of the brain to the front of the brain that, that may be there from birth and provide us with a, 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 a substrate that is going to be useful for doing working memory. Now, we came across something which was very peculiar, which is that uh, we found that the inhibitory cells, if you record it individually, had a very high variability from trial to trial. So he, here is uh, uh, there's a trial for a, a single neuron, and you can see that in some trials, it fires a lot of spikes. Again, this is spike count per bin, but there are some trials, other trials, where it doesn't fire at all. And indeed, it turns out the FANO factor for spike counts is on the order of three, and that can be manipulated by increasing the strength or decreasing the strength from zero up to six. And, and th that also, of course, changes the time constant as well, autocorrelation time constant. So we decided, this is a prediction. Let's go into the experimental data and see what it looks like. And um, Indeed, uh, uh, well, for, well, first we w wanted to make sure that it was uh, actually being driven by the inhibition. The, um, the, 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 this is uh, actually an excitatory neuron that we're looking at, but all of them have high family factors. And indeed, it turns out that uh, if we manipulate the, uh, the subpopulations, the connections between them, that uh, the family factor is, 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 is going to go uh, up or down. And, uh, and so here, here's what we found uh, in terms of trial to trial variability, both uh, in our network, where you can see uh, some trials, a lot of spikes and other trials, none. Uh, and so here is in our recurrent network, we split them up into the, the long and the short. And the FANO factor is significantly higher for the longer than the shorter. And that we found the same thing in the prefrontal cortex. So, so this again is, is, a, is a signature uh, that uh, we may be looking at the same uh, motif within the cortex. Uh, and and it, this also uh, now shows that the time scale is correlated with the, um, the phantom factors correlate with the time scale. You get some that are very high in both the prefrontal cortex and the model. Now one last prediction, okay. Sorry, Terry, uh, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, this is uh, one of my last slides. I have many last slides. 
<laughs> this is, uh, question is, what kind of inhibitory cells? We know there are many different types of inhibitory cells. And so what we're looking for is an inhibitory cells where there's a gradient from sensory areas all the way up to the prefrontal cortex. And indeed, there is one. It's the somatostatin uh, uh, neurons. And, uh, and this is basically, if you look in black, this is the, it's, this, it's a measure of the refraction of inhibitory cells that are somatostatin positive. And you can see they go from a, a low here of, of, of you know, 6,000. Well, the, the, this is actually PV here, uh, which is going, uh, P, the parvalbumin goes down and the somatostatin goes up. This is a fraction here of somatostatin. Uh, this is the prefrontal cortex, uh, various areas uh, in the mouse, uh, and parietal, and, and this is this. So, so w our prediction here is that there is a hierarchy of uh, these inhibitory cells and, and, and these somatostatin cells keep popping up in the other talks that I've, I've noticed, uh, especially here at the, at the Allen, uh, where the, the great data that is now available for being able to pick these out. So I just want to end by uh, giving you a um, sort of a taste for where we are and where we're going. Uh, Gauta, in his uh, opening talk, uh, had a very nice uh, presentation giving an overview, and he mentioned this talk, this, the, this, this paper. If you uh, Google Sainovsky and PNAS, uh, surprisingly, this, this uh, paper will pop up. Uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of deep learning and AI, and and what 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 I think is happening uh, that over the last five years is a you know it's, it's, everyone knows this because you read it in the newspapers is a transformation occurring because the tools and techniques that were developed in the 80s for training neural networks, artificial neural networks, uh, has now had a, a, a lot of practical applications. But the, but I think the deep, a much deeper transformation that's occurring is within neuroscience. Now we've gone from data poor to data rich. In fact, interestingly, the tools and techniques that are being used for analyzing these networks are coming from machine learning. And I wrote a book about this and uh, the, the, the hidden message here is actually not the title. This is just meant to get people to buy the book, but it's really the tagline here, which is artificial intelligence meets human intelligence. Because for the first time we're we're at least using the same language. You know, people in AI are talking about these units and they're talking about uh, uh, learning algorithms and they're talking about uh, uh, you know, training up on tasks that humans do and so forth. And so this is really an extraordinary uh, 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 opportunity because the very same tools that are being developed here now can be taken over to try to help us decipher the brain and the example I gave you is just an, one example of how that could be used. We've, we've seen that uh, the, it may be that the inhibitory neurons have a special role for um, working memory, and this is a testable hypothesis, but more generally, it turns out, and you know, the multi-purpose thing here, it turns out that the very same uh, inhibitory motif here between subpopulations has also been used for decision-making. That is to say, you can use the same motif for collecting information like the Bill Newsom task uh, to find out you know, whether you should go one way or the other. Uh, and, and so uh, it may well be that there is a convergence going on here within the motifs themselves and, and being used for different purposes in different parts of the cortex. Uh, so uh, that's the end. Here's Robert Kim. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like uh, looking over the Pacific as the sun goes down. And thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Terry. Great okay. Talk. So let's see. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, see, uh, first question here in the uh, Q&A already. Uh, well, I think you answered at least in part already. Uh, so from Daniel Gardner, uh, different parts of nervous system have different percentages of inhibitory neurons. If you vary inhibitory neuron number in your RNNs running the two AFC, can you get working memory with stronger inhibitory synaptic strands? Uh, absolutely. I, you know, it, in fact, I think one of the tools that we had there was to 
increase or decrease the strengths of all the, the connections between different subpopulations, excitatory, inhibitory within the populations and so forth. And that's the way we, we picked a way and, and tried to focus in on uh, what otherwise looked like a jungle of neurons connected with each other. Uh, so, so the, but, but, uh, the, the, but there are many different types of interneurons. And so it would be, it's gonna be very interesting to see what roles each one of them may have. And interestingly, the, the, we know that the parvalbumin are, uh, which are very dense in the sensory areas in the back of the brain, uh, they project primarily to the somas. Uh, and the somatostatin neurons project primarily to uh, the, the one subset of somatostatin neurons projects to the dendro dendrites, the apical dendrites. So this is, the, the, I think it's telling us something about uh, sub, not just subpopulations, but also subparts of neurons, you know, which parts of the neurons have what functions. Thank you. Uh, okay. And one, one last, one last <laughs> thought. So, you know, during the era of the single neuron, the, the focus was on pyramidal cells. You know, they were the ones doing the heavy lifting and the, the inhibitory cells were kind of ignored. I mean, in fact, people didn't even know what neurons they were recording from, but they, they, they assumed they were pyramidal because that was the majority. Um, but it may well be that the inhibitory neurons are really the secret to understanding the computation uh, and the complexity of computation in the cortex. And, 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 and it, it, the fact that there are so many different types of interneurons neurons uh, is, is pointing us in that direction. Okay, thanks. So uh, another question here from uh, Joaquin Rapella. Deep neural networks are difficult to interpret. Are they helping to understand the brain? Ah, very good question. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, my PNS paper came from a, a symposium that was uh, organized by mathematicians who wanted to, uh, got very interested in, in the, this question is uh, how, do, how to understand how, how, how do these deep <laughs> networks and how does learning take place? Because it turns out that uh, the, 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 it shouldn't be possible with classical uh, sample complexity. We don't have enough uh, examples to, to, to you know, the, now the biggest networks are up in the hundreds of billions of connections. <laughs> some, we don't have hundreds of billions. I mean, th th that's just huge. Uh, and also we should be stuck by, in local minima. But it turns out now the mathematicians are going in and discovering that the properties of high dimensional spaces, you know, when you get up to millions of dimensions is very different from our intuition about low dimensional spaces. You know, if you're in 3D, you get caught in local minima, but it turns out there are no local minima up there. If you're, if, when you're doing the learning, they're all saddle points. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, if you have, uh, if, if, if you're over parameterized, uh, it, it helps you find solutions. And so these, these the, the, we're, we're gonna, you know, it's not a black box. Th these things are just, I, as I showed you, once you've trained them up, you can go in and dissect them. And, you know, just using the tools that we have in neuroscience. And so we'll figure it out. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Dee Fellerman. So Terry, uh, what is known about co-transmitters in this SST? And does the special spread of SST neurons change across the hierarchy? Okay, so uh, th there's a fantastic story uh, which is just emerging. Uh, Steve Smith has a really a fantastic uh, uh, observation that uh, small peptides are very, very common uh, and there are hundreds in, in the cortex. And there are GPCR receptors as well uh, f that are selective for each of these peptides. And, and a single cell could have 10, 10 peptides. Nobody knows what they're doing there and, and how they're uh, changing, shifting. Uh, you know, they're probably neuromodulators because uh, we know a lot of the pe peptides in other systems like uh, just actually, uh, I, I worked on, when I was a postdoc with Steve Kuffler, I worked on LHRH in bullfrog sympathetic ganglia that uh, activated a synapse, a peptidergic synapse that took one minute to reach peak and 10 minutes to recover. So <laughs> the time scales are enormous. And, and I'm thinking that this is gonna be the next frontier. If you really want to understand state changes in the cortex, uh, and you wanna understand what's happening over longer time scales, it's, it's, it's probably gonna be through these co-transmitters. Uh, 
but right, right now is very little information that we have. Maybe Steve knows more now. I, this is like a year ago when I read the paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, David.